Good afternoon. I speak English. I'm going to try to speak slowly so you can all understand me. When I get excited about a topic, I tend to talk really fast. I am originally from the East Coast of the US, so we have a very fast cadence to our speech. So I'll try to spare you that. What are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about the dark net, um, why you should be concerned about it, uh, why you've probably heard about it in the media, and what you can do about it. Just a quick background on who I am, um, besides just some random guy who got asked to come up here and talk uh, with Luca. Luca's the real star of the show. I'm just here, the figurehead. Um, I was one of the original founders of the Tor project back in 2003. I started building software for Tor. If you'd ever downloaded Tor any time from 2003 to 2009, you used the software I built on my computers. From then, uh, Tor decided to go with nonprofit, which is like a charity, and then I became the CEO. The state, U.S. State Department hired me to turn Tor into a thing because they had activists all over the world running Tor, trying to get around national censorship systems. Um, primarily, Iran and China was their target. And uh, my goal was to work with the, the Department of Defense and other organizations to grow and turn Tor and secure government communications at the same time, providing activists with cover so they could do what they need to do to get around national firewalls. In 2014, I was here in, uh, well, not here, but I was in Portugal, and I met with the European Drug Agency, and they had a bunch of researchers trying to understand crypto markets. If you've heard of the word Silk Road, this is not the Chinese Silk Road. This is the, China, the, the dark net market Silk Road. Um, with the Dread Pirate Roberts. He did a lot of marketing and the press picked up on it. So the, most people know Tor because of the Silk Road. This is how Tor became popular. This is how most of the darknet terminology came about. Um, the D European Drug Agency was trying to understand what is a crypto market? What is the Silk Road thing? What is a dot onion? Can you help us understand darknets? So I helped them with it and I started crawling in 2014. In 2017, I joined Al, and we combined my database with their database. Um, but first, let's step through what, all the, what is all this darknet stuff. This is a picture of the internet. It's an original map from 2001. Um, professor by the name of Vespignani worked on it. He tried to map the entire internet at the time. And the different colors here mean different things. The point is, in order to first understand the network, you need to understand what it looks like, what connects to it, and where are the relationships between everything. So we've all seen this slide before. The surface net is anything Google can crawl, or Bing, or whatever search engine you like to use. Um, it's open, it's accessible, it's easily crawled, indexed, and stored. The deep web is anything that's behind an authentication wall. Think of your bank account. Think of your corporate systems, hopefully. Think of your, your finances. Your personal email, all this stuff is behind a username and password. The stuff that Google and search engines can't crawl, it's called the deep web. It's far larger than what you see available through Google because you probably don't want all of your corporate files out there, um, all of your personal effects out there either. So then there's a, the rest of the iceberg is always pictured as the dark net, as in the underground from the underground, the deepest, darkest, scariest part of the iceberg way at the bottom. Um, this is built on an idea of dark nets have different address spaces. So like we're all used to IP addresses. Um, dark nets use their own cryptographic algorithms to generate address spaces that are vastly larger than the internet is today. So the potential is huge. The reality, uh, we'll see. So there are lots of dark nets. Um, everyone's, many people have heard of Tor. They think Tor is a dark net. Obviously I take myself seriously here with this slide. Um, so the dark nets, you might as well have fun with it, right? So the dark nets are at least 10 that we actively look at and look for and work through. Um, Tor is the biggest one. I2P is the Invisible Internet Project. Freenet is one that's used for distributed file sharing. Gigatribes is proprietary, but it's used heavily by child abusers. Um, Retroshare is the open source version of Gigatribes, basically. Tribbler is a peer-to-peer, -peer, fully decentralized uh, video sharing platform used heavily for copyright violations and just sharing images of, or videos of whatever. Um, GNUnet and OneSwarm are sort of startup that are just playing around with what can we do with a completely decentralized model where there is no centralized tracker, there is no centralized everything. Everything is completely dispersed. Um, ZeroNet is, an, is a fairly new network. It's built on blockchain, Tor, um, and BitTorrent. 
And the idea there is that it's fully decentralized, uses BitTorrent for file transfer between nodes, and uses the blockchain for a persistent identity so people can find your site. Um, if you've heard of the blockchain, if you've heard of Bitcoin, you've heard of the blockchain. Um, it's not Bitcoin, but it's just a blockchain idea. Um, Cindy is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network built on top of I2P as an example of what you can do with when you have an anonymous layer or a private layer, what can you do on top of it. So there's a quick crash course in all the dark nets. Um, most people focus on just Tor. How does this stuff work? So I'm going to give you a crash course on how a dark net works. So think of a VPN. You have your, your one point wants to talk to the, another, and you want to have it heavily encrypted so that people can't read your traffic in transit. Um, and many times you want your own IP addressing scheme on top of it. So you have your PC1 over here talking to PC2, and everything they do is encrypted. That's at the most simplest layer what all these darknets are. Um, here's a better example. Uh, specifically of how Tor and I2P work. Both Tor and I2P are based on a concept called onion routing or garlic routing, which is the idea to layer multiple layers of encryption and multiple redirection of your traffic in between. So instead of one VPN, you have three VPNs. That's really all it is. It's telescoping encryption so that each layer is encrypted in itself. And you may have heard these terms related to Tor or I2P, but here it is. You're at the end looking through the spyglass, on the other end, you go through an entry guard, a middle node, exit node, and then off to your destination. Any one of these points can be anywhere in the world. So especially for Tor, you could be here in Poland, your first hop is in London, your second hop is in Tokyo, your third hop is in Moscow. Um, and you look to the rest of the world like you came out of Moscow. Anyone looking at the network traffic as you're trying to protect your networks, all you see is encrypted traffic to any one of those hops. So hidden services are just flip it around and do it again. Um, so hidden services are the dot .onion part of Tor. Uh, there's also a dot .i2p, which is part of I2p. Um, it's a fake top-level domain, just so that it's only reachable within inside each software. And um, it's heavily encrypted and just basically takes three hops and then turns it into six. So that if you ever wonder why you're trying to investigate a dot .onion or dot .i2p site, you're wondering why it's so slow, because it's got to go through six hops all over the world. Um, that's slow. It's also heavy encrypted at every point, and then there you go. So what you end up doing is you end up talking to, you want to talk to, say this is Silk Road on the side behind me here, um, site.onion. You end up connecting through, you go through three hops, you meet a rendezvous point in the middle, which both you and the site have agreed to meet at in the middle. That's your middle hop, and you have you exchange your data there. So that the goal of this is that you never know where the dot onion is. The, the dot onion never knows where you are. Um, this is also true of I2P and most darknets. The goal is to separate who you are from where you're going. So what have we done? So we've crawled 209,000 onions over the past two years. Um, lots of onions come and go quickly. Uh, we'll, we'll see further what, con what content is on these onions, but the size here, 209,000 is small. Think of what Google crawls every day. Think of what Bing crawls. They're in the hundreds of millions of sites. Um, these darknets aren't very large yet, but they have a lot of criminal usage on it, and that's why people pay attention to it. Uh, this is about what we see every night. So 25,000 onions is about what's, what's reachable and able to be crawled every night. This is an order of magnitude smaller than what we've seen over the past two years, and is generally just the size of how big Tor is right now. Um, there are probably about 40,000 onions created every day that are available at any point in time. Most of those, as you'll see, are not websites you can crawl. So let's do some exploring and get into the details. This is Alpha Bay. This is one of the top markets on the darknet. It sells everything from drugs to identities to credit cards, um, whatever else is here, uh, paraphernalia, psychedelics, all sorts of stuff. It's all there. It's all mediated through unknown people, and it's all transactions are done in Bitcoin. Um, the Bitcoin is interesting because the whole point of Bitcoin is you can trace a transaction from the very beginning to the very end. And so you, they have guides on how to do more sophisticated Bitcoin transactions and not trace it back to your actual uh, real-world identity. Here's a list of one of the trackers I run, keeps track of all the onions that we've seen, how many times they requested, and when they first appeared. So you'll see Alphabet Market, Handsome Market, 
show up multiple times. Dream Market shows up multiple times. Um, these are just the listing of the markets, and the, on the right side over here is how many times they were requested in the past day. Um, so you can see Alpha Bay Market has been requested 15,000 times. It's again, it's not a huge, it's not a huge number compared to like Amazon or whatever your favorite shopping site is. But they are popular. People do figure out how to get in there, and there are multiple mirrors of it. So if you take one of these dot onions down, like this one over here is PWA, blah 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 dot onion. You take that one down. There's three or four more there to serve up. Um, so if if authorities do take down your onion, there's more available. Um, Handsome Market's interesting because it doesn't require a login. You can do all your transactions just straight through, um, I guess, completely anonymously without having to create an ID or anything. There are markets. So this is the clean list of onions in the markets. There are markets in here for exchanging child abuse, for, for arranging for humans to be shipped across the country. Um, and then it gets worse from there. So part of studying when you have all this data, what do we do with it? We work with researchers and we start studying it. Um, these are cleaned addresses of what's out there. As you can see, the number of requests per day, by and far, the largest use of hidden services is botnet can control. So they come up just like domain generate algorithms, how domains get created, get registered in time, like whatever, commandandcontrol.com, commandandcontrol1.com, commandandcontrol2. It's all, all, all algorithmic and is generated uh, by the software so the, so the bots know where to talk to. They're now doing this over Tor. Um, there was a big boost a few years ago of Tor usage. There was a graph and it was like millions of, millions of new Tor users came on. The reality is they were botnets connecting into Tor to get their command and control options. Um, having talked to the botnet author, the guy who did this, he said really it was a proof of concept. Could he get Tor to do it in case all the traditional ways of command and control went away? You'll notice the number two thing. So number one is botnet. Number two is child abuse. Um, Tor is heavily used for child abusers because they feel safe on Tor, and they will exchange worse and worse content. In a non-sequential snapshot, this is over um, from a study. I think it was a three-week study where they watched how many requests. Number one request when you take out botnets was child abuse. Then Silk Road was still around at the time. Agora Market was another market. These are all markets. Torch is a search engine. Um, DuckDuckGo is actually a public search engine that has a hidden site as well. And then there are about hidden wiki. So it's interesting. This is just one of the hidden wikis. If you heard the term hidden wiki, it's just like Wikipedia, but it lists all the dot onions available on Tor. There are about 16 hidden wikis. All of them claim to be the authoritative source of content on Tor. Um, this one is having to be the most popular. So open ports, what do you see? So these are TCP ports. Um, this is why we can only crawl 25,000. If you look at what's available on each TCP port on a hidden service, you have Skynet is a botnet. Um, this is a command control just sitting there waiting for commands or sitting there to give commands to all of the various the, the bots connecting in. Um, HTTP and HTTPS are the next two. Those are the ones you can obviously crawl, and that's what we, we focus on is crawling, you know, just to get content to see what's out there. So here's a picture of what a, of what a site looks like. This is actually an I2P site. Um, I've left all the labels in, even though it makes it kind of look fuzzy. Um, you probably can't read that at all, but the point is it's a simple structure. What's most interesting to most intelligence agencies and most intelligence gathering people are these links here. What links to where? What links to what are these sites that connect to each other? Um, this one's fairly simple. It's a big directory of uh, software that's been grabbed from all over the place to build your own sort of botnet. Um, here's a, a collection of Tor sites. So the dark blue site is the original site we spidered. And then we started watching, where does it link to? What's most interesting is you'll start to see there are actual real domains in here. There's a github.com up there. There's um, some link to Wikipedia. A surprising number of them linked to Google Analytics. Because of course, if you're a criminal and you're building a website, you want to know how popular you are. So you link to Google Analytics to get your web stats on who's browsing your site. Um, obviously, that Google Analytics ID can then be tied back to a human identity somewhere on the clearnet. Other example is this is what it looks like when we crawled. This is February of last year. And this is four months later. It made a bunch of more connections to a bunch more networks. And 
um, expanded far out. And now you have more, more connections to .orgs. There are advertising networks that were linked to. There were, um, if you've heard of a new relic ID, it's sort of like a Google Analytics and ad tracking ID. You can use that for ad tracking too. And you can start to piece this data back together to give a picture of who's running these sites. And then here's the same one three months after that. So this is six months later. You've gone from this sort of sparse design to these all mapped together and all the dot onions they create in host together and then all the dot coms and everything else that's in there. Um, overall, what does the darknet look like? So this is what 209,000 sites look like when they're mapped together. Um, there are two things to look at here. There's sort of the sun cluster in the middle of here's all these, each one of these dots, which I'll zoom in for you later, but each one of these dots is a simple dot onion. Um, it all links together. A lot of them are just big networks of, of dot onions that all link and tie to each other. What's more interesting to me and most researchers are these, this ring on the outside. These are not connected to anything um, except for each other. And they build these tiny little networks that come over here that are like five or 10 sites that link together. Um, in investigation, a lot of these are child abuse sites. They tie to each other, or they're zooophilia sites, which is animals. Um, and they link together, and they don't link to anything else. Um, this is what the close-up of that cluster looks like in the middle. Again, each one of these dots is, this is weighted, so that the more links to it, the bigger the dot. Um, each one of these sites is a dot onion inside there. And it just shows you how connected many of these dot onions are to each other. And then you have the, it's either all together as one big connection or completely separate ring around the outside. So what does this matter to, to you trying to run a company um, and you trying to protect your data? Darknets are an easy way to exfiltrate data because you can install the software, same way any malware is installed. It looks like heavily encrypted traffic. It legitimately uses SSL for its, for its transport and will let you get in and out of many systems. In fact, the entire point of what Tor is designed was to get in through, through your firewalls and your intrusion protection systems and anything else. Um, an example of the data breaches is here's the root causes. You know, only half of them are malicious. The other half are either glitches or human error. Um, and the point here is that we know the Tor side is typically used over here. However, if someone downloads an infected Tor browser or something because they want to go visit some site that your firewall blocks access to, I don't know, pick a movie star, and you want to go see what the movie star is doing, people do this. They'll download Tor browser and then go browse, and then meanwhile they're exfiltrating all their data as they, as they browse about Kim Kardashian or whatever. So how bad are data breaches? Doesn't seem too bad. Back in 2005, we had a couple of them. Um, here it is by size of the, the circle is, a, is the size of the breach. You know, TJ Maxx is a big US retailer. They had 94 million records stolen. Um, revenue and customs, veteran affairs, T-Mobile, all these have been old place. You think we'd learn. Um, in the next five years, it gets worse. You larger breaches and much more common companies, um, LinkedIn, Sony network. Um, the massive American business hack was one of the payment card, credit card processors in the US. There's 160 million records leased, leaked. Um, and it just keeps going from there. Like you see the size get bigger. So surely after 2011, after years of breaches, you know, we start off here, we go to here, it can only get better, right? We, we must have learned in 10 years. Um, no. So in 10 years, it's only gotten worse. Um, Yahoo actually takes up the entire thing because it's 500 million addresses. Uh, but the idea here is that these breaches are getting bigger and companies who you think would be better at protecting themselves are not. Um, people are finding their way in through one way or the other, the entire Turkish citizenship database. Um, things like that that you think would be well protected are not. So what does this mean? Um, are, we just, are we all doomed? No, of course not. Um, we're all here because we all have jobs to make sure we're not doomed. Um, you want to call Luca? Um, and thanks to um, Exitel, and I know they have a high risk team and a, and a quick response unit. You know, we, we're working with them and helping them understand what's going on in your networks. And here's Luca to present the star. I'm really not the star, I promise. Let me go ahead and switch. 
So I believe I'm one of the last speakers before you have to go to lunch, so I'll be as expeditious as I can, also because my battery's only at 20% after Andrew took most of it. Now let's start with something fun. Um, how many of you have gone on the Tor Network? With a show of hands. Don't worry, there's no American intelligence agencies in here, I don't think. Okay, so a few of you, a few of you, got it. So one of the benefits of this job is I get to go around and speak to people and ask fun questions like that. But the second thing is that the majority of you probably haven't gone on tour before. And so I always get asked, uh, what's on tour, right? I also had a bunch of marketing slides which I cut out, so you can thank me for that later. So check it out. Um, I went on tour just a couple of days ago and I found a way on how to make explosives. Can everyone see that? So if you want to go make explosives, on the right-hand side is the actual site in which you can go to, to go do that. Um, I'm not sure if any of you want to, but, you know, there's instructions. I'll give you the presentation later so you can have it. On the left-hand side, it's a little bit fuzzy, but what, is it, what it is, is it's our front end to our database that we, when we collect and scrape this information, you can go in and search it without actually having to go on tour and subject yourself to all the, the fun stuff that Andrew just spoke about. So what's better than making explosives, ladies and gentlemen? It's making better explosives while on LSD. Um, if you are not familiar with LSD, it's a drug. But what this is, is it's an instruction manual along with a bunch of zip files on how to do that. Um, you can imagine why government agencies would be interested in, in this because, well, explosives and drugs. It's actually a bunch of zip files, I don't know if I mentioned that, but you can download multiple files on multiple ways to make explosives. Also relevant to government agencies are Islamic extremists. Unfortunately, this is uh, very common these days, but what, what this site here is on the left hand, on the right hand side is it's a site in English if you wanted to start your own jihadi startup in America. You have all the marketing material, all the publication, the how to, the where to go, the social medias, and the other connections, right? And you can imagine why agencies out there would be interested. Something a little more practical, um, I'm a poor man. Um, I fly coach only. And what this is, it's, it's a way to get access to free money. Uh, this is someone setting up instructions on how to break into ATMs. Are all, if any of you are familiar with ATM skimmers, how many of you are familiar with ATM skimmers? How many of you have been compromised by an ATM skimmer? I have. It sucks. So what it is, it's, it's a, a device that goes on the front of an ATM that when you stick your credit card in or your debit card, it steals your information. And sometimes there's someone watching who will steal your PIN as well. In any case, this is a gentleman here. Uh, again, you can't really see it. I'll get the presentation later. Um, there's a name up front. Um, and it has his contact information. So if you wanted to, you could go buy yourselves one of these and install it on your local ATM. Uh, you can also buy a DDoS attack. In fact, this was a, an upset gentleman, actually, who was offering his services to sell a DDoS attack. Uh, he was actually asking for someone also to target his girlfriend because he had been recently dumped and he needed some help. So what do we do? Uh, we have this very large database, and what we do is we search for otherwise leaked and compromised information, right? ATM information is fun if you're a producer of ATMs, but what's most important to you all? Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, what is the easiest way to break into a company, would you say? That's okay, I wasn't actually asking for a an answer. But the easiest way to break into an organization is if you just had the keys anyway, right? So what if I had a set of user IDs or credentials? I mean, you wouldn't even need to break in. So that's what organizations want. They want to make sure that their user ID and their email addresses and their passwords are not associated and not being sold on one of these nefarious sites. So we have this continual engine that scrapes this information and puts it in this database so that organizations may access it to see if they've been compromised in one way or another. As an example, is anyone here from Vodafone? Perfect. So this gentleman here, uh, we found his information because it's one of the largest uh, telcos in the EU. I wasn't picking on them for any particular reason. But we managed to find his, 
his user ID and also his password. This is a gentleman from uh, Vodafone Spain. Um, so, I mean, yeah. You all have endpoint security, right? But one thing most people don't do is search for, say, IP addresses on the darknet. Because oftentimes, those IP addresses are being talked about, uh, being targeted in a variety of manners. And you know, like any good guys, bad guys also like to brag. I like to brag when I win a basketball game. These guys like to brag when they've compromised the server. And so in this instance, we found a, a company which had their servers compromised, and these these hackers were speaking about that IP address on a, f a Russian hacker site. What other stuff is in there, right? What else do we have in our database? What else is being talked about on the dark net? I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago, there was a site that put out, that essentially said, uh, we have created an Android malware app that you know, targets banking organizations in the EU. What they didn't say were what those banks were. So working with one of our clients, we were able to discover using pieces of code that we had to find out if it was being talked in the darknet and eventually piece together the prize. Uh, what we found out were it was number these banks here that were being talked about. This was a while ago, so I think they've remediated all of it. But what we're trying to show is there's a lot of information on the darknet that can tie back to an organization. A lot of information on the darknet that has extreme relevance and stuff that you want to monitor for. Also, I have the fun app pictures as well. So I hate to turn these things into political things, but our president is very popular these days. And on the course of working through one of our projects, we stumbled across a site that was advocating for, or take, rather, taking donations in Bitcoin for the assassination of our then president-elect. Can anyone guess how far they got in terms of donation amount? It was only 20,000 US dollars, so it wasn't all that much. But we were able to find this information readily on the darknet because we've scraped it and put it into this database. So imagine for a moment that this wasn't uh, President Trump, but rather a CEO of some company. It's oftentimes that we find CEOs or executives or people in, in key positions that have been compromised, right? And this is the stuff that people want to watch out for. So what we can do now, because I cut out all the marketing slides, is we can do a live demonstration. Does anyone want to, is that okay with everybody? Can we do that? I'm going to set this down. Okay. So what we can do is we can type in essentially anything and look through our database in real time to find that information that people care about. So what organization shall we pick? We can pick one of, our, my, you know, one of my favorite organizations in the United States, American Airlines. Or sorry, United Airlines. I just flew them recently. I took a gamble with my life. I'm here. It's OK. So. What do companies search for first? They search for their email addresses, right? So that's exactly what I'll do. I can go search for an organization's, uh, rather an organization can search for their email address and to see how they're compromised. So I'll go ahead and do that. So the question is how many times or how many instances of a United Airlines address appears on our database? The answer is hopefully zero for United Airlines, right? I mean, if you're an org, you'd be surprised how many demonstrations I do where nothing shows up and they get extremely disappointed, um, which is not what you want to actually have nothing. But here you can see, and fortunately it is fuzzy, but you can see about 655 examples of a United Airlines email address being compromised in the darknet. That's a really large amount, right? Some people say, sure, it's only a 50,000 size company. What's 600 email addresses, right? But what if that one email address was, again, some R&D professional or some executive, right? It's game over then. Let's take a better example. Um, I travel to Europe uh, quite frequently, and again, I'm kind of poor. And so what is often sold on the dark net? Anyone want to venture to guess, aside from credentials and such, and ATM skimmers? Credit cards. Credit cards are the number two most things sold in dark net. So what we can do is we can look for some credit cards that we can use later at, where are we all going later today? Club 27? We can use it there. So here, let's take a look at this.
So what I'm looking for right now is any page contained in our database that has 10 to 100,000 credit cards on them. So here, for example, today's date I think is June 20th. So on June 19th, we came across this page here that contains only 12 credit cards. That's not too bad, but they're all relevant, right? Here you can see someone's uh, full information, where they live, their PIN number, if you actually want to go grab that money yourself, their email address, their home address, uh, their social security number for us in the United States, the equivalent of a pencil number over there, over here. But essentially has all the information to steal one's information or steal a credit card. Does anyone have any questions? Hopefully not hard questions. Fantastic. So there are 469 pages that contain this, these parameters, so, so quite a bit. That's essentially a quick, uh, a quick demo and a quick look into our database. Um, that's all I have. Andrew, you want anything else? Anyone have any questions for, for us? If not, I'm gonna pass it back. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.